Hi all. Uh, welcome to our today's talk on the Akomo in not so standard. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but Ashok will uh, do it again, tell you how to pronounce it the right way. So the Akamo Notso is an open document standard for judicial and legislative documents, essentially to store these documents in an XML format, primarily designed for parliamentary, uh, legislative, and judicial documents. Uh, while this has been designed under the Africa I Parliament Action Plan, uh, you, we have with us Ashok, who was involved with the making of the Okomo Notso standard, and he has been in the legislative, legal, informatics space for the past 15 years. And Ashok will walk you through the specification and why courts across the world are using this standard for re recording legal documents. Ashok, over to you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Ashok Hariharan, and I'm going to be talking about the Akoman Toso Open Standard. So it's not Akoman Not So, it's Akoman Toso. Just, uh, just a clarification there. So uh, just a little bit about me before we, uh, you know, before we start. So I've been in the legal informatics space since 2005. Uh, I was a member of the UN project from where Akoman Toso originated. I am particularly interested in the XML stack of technologies, you know, uh, X query, XSLT, things like that. Uh, also, process workflow design, Lexa passes, and front end frameworks. I've done multiple projects internationally uh, that make use of Akomantoso. So, I'm a sort of practitioner of Akomantoso also. And I run a company in this space called Bungani Consulting. So, what exactly is Akomantoso? So uh, I could give you the technical explanation, but let me just start with a story so you understand the context of what exactly a Komantoso is. So right now, you know, we are all doing this conference from home because there's a pandemic out there. And uh, one of the laws that has kicked in because of the pandemic, at least in India, is this Epidemic Diseases Act, you know, of 1897. So mind you, this was a law passed back in 1897 and that is the law that has been used by the government, uh, you know, to, uh, to implement various protocols. So this is the pertinent law for the moment, but it was amended. So they took this law of 1897, but they passed an ordinance in 2020. It was called the Epidemic Diseases Amendment Ordinance of 2020. And uh, this is what it exactly does. So they, they had the law of uh, 1897, they passed a new ordinance for various reasons, which we'll talk about. And what it exactly says is on, uh, on line three, in section three, it says that, you know, uh, we are changing the act as it was in 1897, and we are adding various other conditions to it related to harassment of doctors and so on and so forth. So, uh, and this is what it looks like. So are these just words on paper? So you had the law that was passed in 1897. You had the modern one which changed the old law of 1897. But are these really just words on paper? Not really. So uh, just to give some background, this was 1897. You know, that's a doctor giving some kind of treatment to somebody who got the bubonic plague in Bombay. Uh, that was the reason why the law was passed, the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897. And apparently, they didn't have to use it until 2020. And this is, the, this is a picture from Bombay now, you know, all these doctors dressed in PPE gear and taking the temperature of someone. So uh, what happened was uh, there were doctors who were being harassed by people because they thought the doctors were carriers themselves. So they had to change the Epidemic Diseases Act because of social conditions. So they passed the ordinance, which I showed you just now. And if we, if we consider the original Epidemic Diseases Act, as I've labeled it original, this is called the Amending Ordinance or the Amending Act, so to speak. Uh, what it has is merely instruction. This document just says that go to Section 3 of the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 and add these new lines. That's exactly what it's doing. So it has instruction which allow 
an amended Epidemic Diseases Act to be created. So uh, what they publish is this, and what legal drafters go and do is take these changes, like the way you do track changes in Word, they go and take the original 1897 Act, they go and type in these changes, and they apply it. And that creates the new amended Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 as changed in 2020. That is roughly, uh, you know, uh, to put it crudely, that is how things happen. That is how acts get changed. So uh, just to take a longer term perspective, you know, I've added a picture of 2040 there. Hopefully, you know, Mumbai is going to look like that. Let's uh, all think positively. Uh, and so until March 2020, so I'm just rewinding back to March 2020, when this amended ordinance had not been passed. So until March 2020, the original 1897 Act was applicable. It was not uh, the old 18, you know, it was not, uh, this amendment had not been passed. Then what happened in 1820, in 2020, we passed uh, the amended uh, Diseases Act. And from tw April 2020 onwards, the amended 2020 Act version is applicable until any future amendment. Yeah. So if we assume that there is a future Epidemic Diseases Act, 1897, with further amendments passed in 2040, you'll have the original 1897 Act, you'll have the amended 18, uh, 1897 Act as amended in 2020, and then you'll have the 2040 version. So uh, this, is, this whole chain is called the Epidemic Diseases Act. So the Epidemic Diseases Act is not just one document, but it is all of these, the, uh, you know, the complete history of these documents. And why is that? Because all three of the laws can be applicable in 2040. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the Indian legal system, sometimes cases get stuck in court. So let's say somebody went to court in January 2020, uh, and somebody else went to court uh, in uh, May 2020, and the co and the cases were really, you know they were related to the application of this act, but uh, they went on for decades, and it, it'll it'll turn out that in 2040 the new act will be applicable, but the old cases. Uh, for the old cases that happened after April, April 2020, this amended uh, 1897 Act is going to be applicable, while the one prior to April 2020, the, the original Epidemic Diseases Act is going to be applicable. So all three versions of the law can be applicable in 2040. Many people don't realize this. Many tech people who approach the legal space, they don't realize these nuances until it's too late. So that's why I'm highlighting that. and because. Uh, this idea is part of Akumantoso. This core idea is part of Akumantoso. The law is applicable based on its point in time. That is a key thing to keep in mind. So the key ideas and concepts are that, uh, I'm just summarizing it here. So legislative and judicial data is very different from financial or sales data. So number one, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal data is all interconnected across time. You saw in the previous example, all three versions could be applicable at a, at a particular time. It's also very long lasting. So in our case, it was like a hundred year old act, but it would go to hundreds of years, depending on how old the legal canon is in your country. The law is about documents. It's not records in a database because uh, that is how tech people approach everything, you know, trying to normalize stuff, putting it into a database and so on. The process is legal data. So the process itself, the way the law is created is actually pertinent data. Content, metadata and presentation are important. I'll show you what that literally means. So all these ideas together are part of the key ideas and concepts of Akomantoso. So what is Akomantoso? So you had some background of laws and how they change over time and uh, how they're impacted by different things. So Akomantoso is an XML document format, uh, much like other XML document formats which are out there, 
like uh, data or doc book or uh, open document uh, format or open XML. You know, all these are popular formats. They're used in Word, they're used in open office, they're used in archival systems and so on. A common so is not just a format to store laws, it's also an approach to manage legal docs and associated uh, information. So it is a standard. I say it's a standard because it's not uh, created by a company or, you know, or by a vendor trying to sell software. It's under a body called the OSS standard body. If you, if you Google up OSS and standards, you'll find that this is a kind of industry organization, much like IEEE and you know, other industrial bodies uh, who create standards for different sectors. So how do we pronounce a coma toso? It's a coma in toso. That is the right way to pronounce it. It is, uh, means link heart in the Akan language. That uh, goes back to where this project began because we were uh, you know, based out of Kenya in Nairobi and that is where the project came out of. So we decided to take something from Africa. So it began with the UN, it is now with the standards body. How was this created? So it, it was not created out of thin air. Uh, people didn't just sit down and uh, you know, come up with a brand new idea on their own. No, you know, this was built on the back of a lot of existing work done by other people, like the European Parliament, uh, you know, like uh, this uh, UN Pan-African Interoperability Framework, the legal XML community. Uh, so in 2006, the UN uh, essentially collaborated with the University of Bologna, which is uh, the oldest legal faculty on the planet. They go back to 1088, I believe. So they're like a thousand year old legal faculty. Uh, so, you know, as the UN, uh, you know, we collaborated with them and uh, we basically started building this legal standard. So it went through multiple iterations. It adopted different ideas from around the world. You know, I've mentioned, took some ideas from Brazil. It took some ideas from uh, this other project in Netherlands. Finally, in 2012, the UN decided it was not the right place uh, for a standard. So it got handed over to this OASIS standards body where over a five year period, it went through something called a standard ratification process. So it went through committees, it went uh, with involvement of different parliaments and uh, you know, people in the commercial legal space. And then finally in 2017, they released uh, Acomantoso as a legal document standard. It's the only legal document standard out there. So what are legislative and judicial docs? So they cover a whole gamut of documents. Uh, these are just things I've, took, uh, I've taken out of the top of my head and put them there. Uh, uh, but there are, uh, you know, there are a couple of dozen more or even more because every time I see a parliament or I see some court documents, there's always a new one in, uh, you know, depending on the national or cultural tradition, there's a new one. So this is just a bunch of, uh, you know, documents that, that came to my mind, you know, bills, acts, debates, uh, amendment, amendments, things that typically pass through a legislature and uh, which uh, are uh, required to produce a law. And uh, these are on the right side, you will see they are legal documents coming out of courts. So who's using it? Just a quick view, it's, you can see it's being used around the world, not by small bit players, but it's being used by the data archives in the UK, it's being used by the US House of Representatives, uh, it's being used by the European Parliament, it's, uh, there's ongoing projects in FAO, and also uh, in Spain, uh, you know, they have the uh, Office of the President who are in charge of uh, legislation, they have a big project going on there. Uh, they have the LexXML uh, project in Brazil, they have the Library of Congress in Chile, unfortunately nothing out there in India. You know, in India the whole legal informatics space is really I, I think it's uh, very, it's at least 10 years behind the rest of the world. Uh, and not many other projects in Asia, though I've heard of initiatives in Hong Kong and in Japan. So what are all these people using Akomantu so far? So I'm just gonna give you a quick uh, view. You know, this, these are all the things that people are using Akomantu so far. Drafting legislation, publishing laws, building search engines on laws, uh, consolidating amendments into laws, you know, uh, you know, 
so you know anything surrounding the law or judgments or uh, legality that goes uh, into the ecumenical bucket and they're doing a whole variety of things and who, who are these people so there are different entities who find use for a common so so the most typical use case are national and uh, regional parliament so you know for example in india we have the lok sabha then we have the state legislatures so those are like typical candidates for this stuff then there are the you know different uh, judiciary uh, the supreme court the high courts you know even the smaller courts in your countries or uh, places you know they are all applicable candidates international organizations and agencies uh, people who pass standards uh, these international organizations have legislative bodies with member countries who participate and uh, they produce standards or you know they produce communiques and resolutions and so on those are candidates organizations publishing laws online you know uh, legislative and judicial monitoring organizations uh, they consume you know they're consumers of the data but i've seen people even uh, creating data uh, in a common so from national archives digital libraries commercial uh, law data vendors so that's the whole spectrum of players in this space why are these organizations using a common so uh, just to give some uh, reasons as to why some of these organizations are using a common so so in many countries there are transparency requirements under law so they have uh, access to information laws so they have to publish their laws in machine readable formats uh, you know and uh, to be to allow people and other parties to do things with it to to, to basically query the data uh, so by this i don't mean just laws but things like debates you know parliamentary debates who voted for what that is actually very interesting and crucial data in many countries to see who voted for what law and uh, so because then they can build a thread in terms of why are why are certain members of parliament voting for certain things are there lobby groups involved so there's uh, there's all manner of information that is extractable once you once you have it in a open standard there's also shared knowledge uh, you can provide a uh, it's essentially provides a common vocabulary to build upon uh, distillation of best practices so uh, you know, basically, Akuman Tuso uh, has been built uh, on the back of best practices. So, uh, as the standard was uh, developed over a ten-year period, it has adopted uh, best practices and standards from parliaments, from courts, and uh, from other archivists. You know, people who have been doing this for dozens of years, and it has distilled a lot of the best practices in the standard itself. And you can build skills around the standard. So, if you look at different uh, legislators and courts around the world, many of them have tried to build their own system. They think their problem is unique. Uh, they are the only people in the world to have this problem. So they went around building their own system. Uh, but then, you know, systems need to be updated. It takes uh, money and time. But if you have a standard, then you can build around that, and you can kind of use the common pool of uh, you know of of like knowledge and developers and people who are around it to build it so uh, using a standard also lowers risk for many people so uh, because a standard means it has worked somewhere else for someone else if if they can google up they'll find a case probably and they'll uh, find out that other people have used it it's also risky to build systems and design your own document formats from scratch because uh, you know laws tend to survive for very long periods of time so you want to have uh, a design which is robust and tested and has been built with longer periods in time so building on top of a standard uh, automatically reduces risk it also lowers cost because uh, using a standard allows you to reuse stuff other people might have built systems uh, other people might have built a library to work on the standard so you can take that from the open source space and reuse it it also provides a sharing of best practices you can read about how somebody else implemented a whole system based on this technology and then you can reapply you can take their best uh, uh, you know you can take their context and adapt it to your own context 
and uh, save time and cost. Uh, there's also a marketplace of vendors and consultants around the standard. Okay, so how are laws made? This is a graphic I pulled off the internet. It uh, talks about how laws are made in America, uh, but the context is applicable everywhere because this is what happens in very many countries, including ours. And uh, it's talking about a bill being introduced in parliament, the bill being, you know, going through parliament, being debated, committee work, debate amended, finally it becomes law. So this is the entire process that the law goes through before getting published. And uh, this entire process is important. Legal data is interconnected. So if you saw the previous graphic, I've just distilled that into a simpler form here, you know, uh, as a cycle. So laws are drafted, uh, you know, they are drafted in parliament by people called legal drafters who talk to members of parliament and then they go and type in their little computer in there and uh, they produce bills. Uh, they could be amendments also. These get discussed in parliament. Uh, they get debated by members of parliament. Those debates are recorded. Uh, then the laws uh, are passed, they become acts, they get gazetted, those are more official documents. Time passes, you know, there's social changes, you know, new pandemics and so on. And then the laws get uh, either challenged in court or, you know, there's an ordinance passed or sometimes uh, the court itself is making a judgment which is saying, you know, we want to strike down section three of that particular act and so on. So um, in court or in parliament, when they want to change the law, they usually debate, you know, and they look at why did the law, uh, you know, why did the law say what it meant, you know, did it mean, uh, is, is what they meant actually applicable in the current context, so we need to change it. So, and then the law gets changed and then the whole cycle goes on. So, that is why we have laws from 1897, which are still applicable now because they can be amended and they keep going through this cycle. Legal docs are also very long lasting. So this is something, again, many tech people, they don't get a handle on because they're trying, they're used to solving problems in the now and they don't think about the past. So when we were designing Apo uh this was, you know, so I, you know, I'm from the tech background originally. And so when I first saw the laws, you know, I thought, hey, this is a computer science problem, you know, putting things into databases. No, 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 it's not like that. So the laws are very old, you know, for example, the oldest extant law now is the Statute of Marlborough, which goes back to 1267. It's a UK law. And I believe four chapters from this law are still applicable. I think the oldest Indian law is probably the Indian Penal Code of 1860. Uh, you know, maybe there are some local laws in Goa which are older than that, which are still applicable from the Portuguese era. But, you know, that is uh, at least what I could Google up and find. So uh, in terms of longevity, uh, there are two aspects here. You know, when people deal with legal data, they have short-term needs. So this is, the, this is the problem I mentioned about tech people trying to solve problems now. So they want to use the legal data in different ways. They want to put it on an app. They want to index it with the search engine. They want to run it through document workflows. They want to consolidate the legislation, or maybe they want to classify something. So uh, this picture here on top on the right is from, uh, you know, from the U.S. House of Congress search engine, which allows you to search laws. You know, and the one below is from the UAE, uh, you know, data archive of their laws, where they've done some kind of analytics with the laws. I can't read Arabic, so I don't know what it was about, but just to give you an idea. So these are short-term means, and the problem is many tech people tend to approach legal data from this point of view. Like, I want to solve a problem now, so let me just build a system, or let me try to store the data in the present context and see uh, and solve the problem now. But it does not work like that because, uh, I, you know, are your laws and judgments going to be readable in 10, 20, 30, 40, or 100 years' time? So if you're going to put it into little databases, is that database going to exist? You know, those are questions that you really have to think. And those are questions that are being answered by Akomantosu. So uh, and you can't rely on specific software architecture or frameworks or even the existence of documentation in 40 years time. So people have to 
be able to take your data, understand what it meant, and uh, you know, build systems on top of that, just on the basis of data. So that is the orientation that Apomantoso takes. It's got a very long-term perspective. And in terms of long-term, it looks to the future and it also looks to the past. So docs have to be self-expressive and self-contained. Uh, so in terms of longevity, so this is the space that it falls in. So there's short-term needs that uh, are important, but there are also long-term challenges. So Akumantoso falls into that space in the middle. It tries to enable those short-term needs and also tries to reduce those long-term challenges. Uh, it's always there in the back of its mind. So legal docs are not records in a DB. So this is the classical problem I mentioned. You know, so I'm a tech person. I see the law, and I think you know this can be normalized. Act title, uh, act date, long title, preamble, section one. So I'll put all those into columns in a in a database record, and I'll stuff it into a DB. Sounds great, right? Eh? So that's a great design. This is very bad in the legal space. This is not good at all. It's not predictable because you saw one law and you thought that that is how the data structure is. But then in two months time, there's uh, some legal drafter is going to come up with another design or there's going to be a law that you had not seen yet, but in the past, which will completely defy that structure that you imagine. So putting it into a database like that normalized, there's no room for flexibility. The other aspect is, you have to always have some kind of software to recompose the law and show it. But the, the problem is then, if you want to render your law uh, in 20 years time, you're still stuck to the middleware. You don't have to call the consultant when he's 80 years old to pull out data from your system, because just because that's the only way you can recompose your legal document based on the middleware that the guy wrote 30 years ago. So, uh, so th these are problems that are common to so addresses. Uh, it's about self-containment. So if a law is a document, it's always stored as a document. It looks at separation of concerns, uh, which is which tech people will understand very clearly, but I'll show that with an example. Uh, the content and metadata live together, but they only reference, uh, but only to reference each other. So uh, I'll give you an example of what that means. So for example, content, metadata, and presentation. So I said Akumantosu can look into the future, but uh, here I'm looking into the past. Uh, this is the Nalanda inscription from 860. So uh, this is uh, from the Nalanda, uh, from the ruins of Nalanda, some archeologists pulled out this copper plate, uh, you know, which is uh, a land grant given by the king to some noblemen. And it is actually a legal document. So if you look at it uh, closely, you can break it down into a preamble, a body, and a conclusion. So this is in Sanskrit. I can't read it, but I actually read the translation. So it has clear segmentation like that, uh, just like a law has. Uh, it has type metadata. So there's a royal decree there right on top. Uh, you know, the, the, the king's emblem, which says it's a royal decree. It has an authority character saying, you know, this is under the authority of King uh, you know, Deva Paladeva. It has place saying, where was this law passed? So Mudgagiri is the place. It has language metadata saying it's Sanskrit. So in that period, they were, you know, they were publishing stuff in uh, uh, Sanskrit and Pali. So I suspect the Pali was written on paper or palm leaf. That got destroyed and only the proper leaf one survived. And it has a date right at the end, which says uh, year 39, day 21. Years always began with the uh, birth of the king, so I, I presume that is what it's about. Uh, and then it has, uh, so this is authentic content because it is authenticated by the king's uh, royal seal. So much like how we put rubber stamps or we put uh, wax seals nowadays, that is how it was authenticated. It has inline metadata, it has metadata within the content, it has names of places, it has names of people, it has designations of who these people are to who this land is being granted to, and so on. So this is a legal document from 860. And this can be represented in a Komantoso. So there is, uh, this is the content. It has presentation. So it's, uh, the presentation is basically copper plate. Uh, but the same law can be transcribed into a computer, and then the presentation becomes HTML. So, so you get the idea how content is uh, separated from presentation. You can take the content and render it into 
a digital view which looks like a copper plate, or you can put it into your page or your mobile and so on. Um, and there's metadata around it, and then there's the presentation aspect. So this is a modern law. This is, uh, you know, the U.S. code, uh, you know, one of their laws from 2011. Uh, so I've given it the same treatment. You can see, you know, what is applicable for the 860 law is also applicable for a law from 2011. There's metadata, there's a preface, there's a body, there are sections, there are short titles. So Akumantoso aims to identify and tag specific parts of the document using a standard vocabulary uh, in a way that in, this information can be extracted and made sense of. So the process is also legal data. So I mentioned this earlier that the process is very important. Uh, so the process in this case uh, is what are the circumstances surrounding uh, a judgment or a law that was passed? We saw the circumstances that went around the Epidemic Act, where I showed you that the law was passed in 1897. There was the bubonic plague in Mumbai. And then, uh, you know, time passed. And then there was a need to amend the law uh, in 2020. And then the amendment was, uh, was passed. But it meant that the whole chain of laws starting in 1897 until 2020 is one work. You know, that is, when we talk about the Epidemic Act, it, is, it means the whole body of work surrounding that because that provides the full legal process and the full legal context surrounding that. So uh, that would include debates which went into why was that Epidemic Act passed and so on. So here I've given an example of a judgment uh, uh, you know, which was a very interesting and pertinent judgment passed in the, uh, you know, in the International Court of Justice in the 60s. Uh, so uh, basically, Ethiopia took South Africa to court, uh, to the International Court of Justice, saying uh, that the apartheid policy uh, was against human rights. And uh, they ended up losing the case, uh, incidentally, in 1966. Uh, and uh, you can see there's the history of the case going, you know, with different opinions, dissenting opinions, declarations, and so on. And there was one particular dissenting opinion from a guy called uh, Judge uh, Tanaka who voted against uh, this particular judgment. So uh, the process, uh, so essentially, Akumantoso allows you to track uh, this kind of context to the law. So. If you want to know who dissented, uh, you, can, you can essentially query and know who dissented. Who was the person who dissented? It was a guy called Tanaka. What was his role? He was a judge. And uh, what was his opinion? You can pull out even the structure of the opinion. So you can query different contexts. You can pull out all the opinions. You can find out what was the type of opinion. Was it dissenting? Uh, was it in agreement? And so on. And so. That's what I mean by the entire process uh, is part of essentially legal data. Uh, there is an Akumantosu community out there. Uh, if you Google up, you will find plenty of links. Uh, but essentially, just to give you a summary, so there is an annual Akumantosu conference which is held every September in Italy, where uh, which is typically hosted by the Department of legal informatics in the University of Bologna. And uh, this is the place where people working in the Akumantoso space, be they parliamentarians, uh, you know, uh, people in the data archiving space, uh, uh, people in the tech space, you know, vendors, you know, uh, companies operating in this space like mine, we normally go to this conference and we present what we did in the past year. We, you know, we basically talk to other people who are dealing with this. There's the OSS technical committee, uh, which is dealing with the standard. Uh, there are also associated standards, which are kind of related to Akumantoso. So one is called Legal Rule ML, uh, which is about uh, putting machine readable rules. So, uh, you know, rules and regulations are also covered by Akumantoso. So, for example, uh, you know, your uh, uh, tax notifications, you know, customs tax notifications, they are literally thousands of them and they and they also follow the same model that you have a customs notification issued by the uh, 
by the Indian uh, customs body which changes the previous notification. And that notification changes a prior one. There's always this chain of a notification changing a prior one and that prior one changing a prior one. So that is the typical use case for Momento. So that's what it addresses. Now people have to go through paper to find out what was applicable in my case, which is going on since 2006. So, you know, I have to pull out the paper and see what is the connected notification, so on. So all, all those cases are being uh, addressed by Apomantoso and some of these associated sister standards. So there's another one called Legal Citem, uh, which I think is still going through uh, essentially a committee process, so which looks at standardizing legal citations. Uh, there's a public mailing list. Uh, there's the Akomantoso XML mailing list on Google Groups, uh, where which has a membership of around 500 or 600, I believe. Uh, and uh, there are people asking questions, they how to use it. Uh, people doing things in Hebrew and in uh, and in Arabic and in Japanese. So it's all there. So there's uh, vendor supported systems out there. There are commercial vendors I know who are supporting Akomantoso. Uh, building solutions on it. Uh, there's a growing community of open source applications and tools. So uh, even our company, you know, we have published uh, open source applications and tools. There's uh, there's a site called schema.acomantoso.com which uh, allows you to query the schema as a learning tool. Uh, I've got a blog called acomantoso.io where I infrequently write about Akomantoso. So that is essentially what uh, Akomantoso is about. That was the last slide. Uh, do you want to show us any websites that are already using it for people to have a look at it? Sure. I believe the UK Data Archive is using it. Uh, hang on. I, I don't have the link on me right now. Uh, hang on, let me just get it for you. Thank you. Uh, but people, if you have any questions, uh, there is uh, the question and answer tab. You can just ask the questions down there. If you're watching it over YouTube, you can even pass, paste your questions in the YouTube chat and we can take it over from there. While we wait for questions, uh, uh, let, let me field mine first, Ashok. Sure, go ahead. Hello, all. This is, uh, this is Prasanna. I'm a practicing lawyer in Delhi, recently qualified as an advocate on record in the Supreme Court. And I have a background in technology as well, so I wrote enterprise software for uh, more than a decade. So I'm already sold on both the need for and the desirability of a standard in a space like this. Uh, it, when I first took to law, coming from a technology background, two things that struck me were that first, law was so much like code. So a project like this, a standard like this, was certainly something that I imagined would exist, would probably evolve. Uh, something that must be there. The second thing that, that struck me was that there was nothing like code. And so there was, so I was really torn between these two, uh, two, two different kinds of thought, schools of thought, one may say. Uh, so I started both as an optimist and a skeptic at the same time for this rule. Really. Right. In fact, to give you a couple of examples on why it is like code, in fact, there was a seven judge bench of the Supreme Court of India in the early 70s that tried to interpret what the lists of constitution meant. So there were, the, there were three lists under Schedule 7, which kind of delineates the powers between the state and the center. List one of, uh, list one of Schedule 7 in the constitution refers to all powers of parliament as the union legislature. And then list two 
refer to powers of the state legislature and at least three refer to the concurrent power that both state and union legislatures can legislate on. So there was this question. So there was one particular entry in the list one that said taxes on everything except agricultural land. There is another entry in list one that said that's a residual provision, it's a catch-all saying everything that is not enumerated in either of the lists is a power that belongs to parliament. And this question of taxes on agricultural land, it was not enumerated on either of the three lists. So the question that arose in the before the seven judges of that bench was, how do we interpret this? So whether we interpret this entry to say everything except agricultural land, whether this refers to an intention of the constitution makers to exclude this legislative field from parliament's domain. Or whether we should interpret the residual clause to mean that it's a catch-all anyway, and therefore there is, it's not enumerated anywhere, it will be caught all by the residual provision. So that, they, in fact, they went out and, and said it is, so all of these three lists need to be interpreted as though they are definitions. They're not transactions. They don't confer powers. So it's very similar to code where we have separate, we know, we know what is an invocation and what is a definition, for instance, in a, in a one on your environment programming language, for instance. Right? So this particular, and even in tax law, we have what are called charging provisions and what are called definitional provisions. So in many ways, our laws are like codes. In fact, our penal code is called the penal code, Indian penal code. We have a code of civil procedure, code of criminal procedure, the insolvency and bankruptcy courts, several of them are core courts. On the other end of the spectrum, where I, where I feel laws are anything but, uh, anything like, no, no, nothing like court, is, is the industry that is, uh, that is developed around the interpreting laws. So as you said in your presentation, Ashok, when you said the whole point is to make the laws more readable, right? Readable, I, I presume, is more understandable. It is for the general public to know what the law is. Right? Ignorance of law, law is no excuse. And so it is for the general public to know what the law is. But the question of what is the law is what is actually, that's the industry that is, that is that all our lawyers and the judges, all of them try to discern it for the general public as to what the law is. And what is stated in the statute is just a starting point of what the law is. So I'll give you an example under a rent control legislation. So a landlord has a right to evict a tenant if the landlord, landlord has bona fide requirement for any residential property that he has leased out. So this phrase less residential property was, was interpreted by the Supreme Court to include commercial property as well. So by a stroke of pen, the entire gamut of uh, the meaning of the legislation got changed as to whether, because there was a specific intent only to include uh, residential property within the purview of that particular right to evict on bona fide requirement that was expanded to include pro commercial property as well. This is something that you will never know under, uh, uh, until you know the judgment that actually interpreted this place. And that is true of many of our laws. In fact, uh, in fact, there are many common law jurisdictions where there are, there, is, there are volumes produced what are called restatement of laws. Mm -hmm. What is written is, is just a starting point and as you said, it is organic growth. In fact, sometimes it is, it is growth where you don't even realize and it's completely unrecognizable from what the text is. And there are certain other problems that compound as well. I'll give another example of a recent case that uh, I am currently litigating. In fact, we have a question of whether indentation in a provision, in a, in a statute itself means anything at all. So there's an example. So that, is, uh, that is not a surprising thing to hear, you know, things like indentation or uh, drop caps, you know, I've seen cases like that where the drop caps has a particular meaning just because somebody interpreted it to mean something in the past. Uh, you see that also with side note requirements you know, which are technically very challenging to render, but they become 
part of like standing orders or tradition of how the law is written or they are part of a legal drafter style guide just because they decided to write uh, notes by hand historically on the side uh, carrying that over into the text space becomes a challenge uh, but those are you know kind of the presentation issues that are also being addressed by the standard so one one whole part uh, of the standard is how to enable publishing on paper so you know one uh, you know some of the projects i've been involved in there was one i did with fao uh, which was all about uh, being able to draft meeting documents uh, you know using akomantoso online being able to do uh, communal amendments you know being able to do it uh, together as a group and then being able to render it on paper in six different uh, languages in the way they had been rendered for the past 30 years so these all seem like conflicting requirements uh, as i said you know there is a requirement from the past and there's a requirement from the future so it's trying to bridge uh, both those uh, requirements so you'll find other cases for example in the us code uh, they refer to line numbers uh, not just in the us but you'll find that in different countries you know where for historical reasons they refer to line numbers and the line number only has meaning on paper that to on specific sizes of paper but it does not carry over into the online space so how do you cater to a past a requirement from the past that requires referring to line numbers on an a4 sheet or a letter size sheet and then also support rendering that same law on ipad or being able to compose the law on an ipad or you know some kind of modern browser-based device so those are the kind of tech challenges it tries to balance out you know you want to support the past because there's a whole legal canon going back a thousand years uh, which needs to be supported and then you also want to support needs of the future so not just from the presentation point of view or uh, you know from the drafting point of view but also in terms of searchability like you you know the case you mentioned in terms of interpreting the law itself uh, is is this a definition uh, so what akomantoso allows you to do is take a law take segments of it and say this is a definition so you define it semantically you put a tag in there saying this is a legal definition and uh, so it is clear even for somebody looking at it 20 years in the future as long as they can read english or uh, they uh, you know they can understand that this tag says definition so this is what they meant they meant it as a definition so and that's what it means and even there there is a whole context of local jurisdiction so if you uh, you know for example in india there are parts of the laws called articles you know you have uh, you know within articles you have sections i believe if i'm not uh, wrong so in other countries they could have sections as a, as a higher level structural entity then within that they can have articles so uh, you know it's not rigid in those ways so it tries to fit your local jurisdiction if article is your main structural entity in your country you can use article and you can put sections inside it so uh, because uh, you know 50 years in the future the people in your country know what the law means and you know they know what the article means they know what the section means so they're going to interpret it appropriately so that is the whole context of it so uh, you know because a lot of times understanding what the future might be is just uh, you know how the past was so that is you know that is the kind of space it sits in okay we have some questions prasanna do you have a follow up yeah so my, my uh, quick follow up was that in india at least on the question of indentation we've not had case law on whether indentation place uh, has any role at all in interpreting what a particular proviso means so that's something we hope to iron out in the next few years but in the meanwhile uh, there are a few questions that um, uh, i take uh, yeah so there's one by uh, mr jaydeep who is an advocate the government doesn't adopt the standard what is the path to make it workable in india 
which has a huge volume of legal data generated on a daily basis. Does it depend on a body of volunteers constantly tagging and updating data? Now, I really think this is, this is not something that can be done by volunteers uh, for the simple reason that it's the government that is producing the, da you know, the data. You know, the government is passing the laws and uh, it can be an infinite effort for the, you know, for the community to go and try to re-encode the law in this form uh, when the producer is actually the government. The most efficient way is for the producer to produce it in this format. That is what they are doing in most other countries. They are producing it in this format, uh, you know, instead of trying to take, because I've done projects where I've taken PDF documents uh, like I did a project with uh, the ECOWAS body, uh, which is the economic, uh, uh, which is the economic uh, community of West African states. It's like the, uh, you know, it's kind of like the European Union, but for West African countries. And uh, they had like 30 years worth of meeting documents and resolutions and so on. So, and they had it in PDF. So I had to convert. You know, it was like a seven-month project where we sat and converted. Uh, you know, 30 years worth of their, these legal documents into Akomantoso XML. You know, we had to write a whole bunch of DSLs, domain-specific, uh, you know, uh, language processes, just to take the PDF text and convert it to Akomantoso XML. It is a lot of work. So instead, if they had been drafting their laws and producing it in this format, it makes things very easy. And that is the route what it should be. But where I believe, uh, you know, uh, the community plays a part is essentially putting pressure on government to uh, adopt standards and, uh, you know, provide us data in open standards. You know, that is uh, what it should be. Maximum what the community can do is take specific acts and, uh, you know, as a civic, uh, you know, uh, to make things easier, let's say, things like the Contract Act or Traffic Act, you know, produce like, uh, I think that is the only level that is feasible for, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for the wider community to do it, to take specific acts and provide, I don't know, apps or sites that allow a historical rendering of that in the context of, uh, you know, let's say the Contract Act. You take uh, 10 years of the Contract Act and you put all the consolidated legislation in context. So, you know, but, I, I think that also has commercial implications for people trying to sell services. As you mentioned, there's a whole body of uh, lawyers and law companies who are there to interpret the law and tell you that, you know, we have all the versions of the law and we know what that means. It's very hard to find like all the, you know, all the historical amendment chain for say the contract law in India or the company act. It's not there, you know, you have to pay a vendor to get it because on the government sites, it's, hidden in like dozens and dozens of PDFs, you can't find it. So that is the source of the problem. And I think uh, the only solution is to make them do it. They have the money, they have the resources, and uh, they are the ones who should be adopting standards. You know, they, uh, they need to have uh, legal drafting departments who understand tech and, uh, you know, who have some vision. You know, if you, if you have a vision for a country, then you should be having the law is also as part of the vision. So that's, that's what I think, you know. And it's not just law, it applies to also judgments. Uh, we are not an English speaking country, so we have uh, regional languages. So, uh, you know, it also applies in the regional context very much, the state laws, because for most people, it's the state laws that apply to them. You know, the health, uh, health and education laws are at the state level, most of them. So, uh, I, I think the linguistic context is very important here. There are two quick follow-ups here. So one is by Jaydeep himself, where he asks if, uh, because there is going to be a huge amount of manual tagging involved, if we have to do a porting of some of the earlier laws that we have to the AKN standard. The other follow-up that I have for you, um, uh, Ashok, is whether the standard itself supports this flag of whether a particular legislation has been produced in the AKM format from the source, or is it something that is backported? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the second part of the question. 
Now, so the standard itself supports a flag or, or some kind of indication whether a, the, a particular document has been produced from the source or whether it is a backported version of an earlier law that is produced in another form. Ah, okay. No, no, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, so as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, let me just take you back to this slide. I didn't go too technical because I was not sure what, uh, you know, whether people have been exposed to this at all, but I'll just take you back to this slide. Uh, for example, can I just share my screen? So uh, in this slide, hang on, let me just change the, yeah. So you can see that, you know, this is the act and there are three versions of it, you know, there's the one of 1897, there's the, uh, one produced in 2020, and there's the future, assuming we are in 2040. So, uh, you know, uh, so what Akuman, uh, you know, what Akuman Tosu does is it follows the IFLA standards. So, the IFLA is like a library body, and they have a thing called, uh, you know, functional requirements for bibliographic records, which basically classifies any publication in terms of, you know, it's a work. So, this entire body of three versions, you know, the full historical chain uh, of the act is a concept, you know, it's not a physical document, it's a concept called the, called the Epidemics Act. That's one level. And then it looks at it at the expression level, which is in terms of if it's produced in English and Hindi, you know, there are two expressions of it. One is in English and one is in Hindi. So, the, the, you know, again, that's a conceptual idea. And then there's the manifestation, which is the physical form itself. So, if it was produced as XML, it would have the primary manifestation as XML. If it was produced in PDF, then the, uh, you know, the primary manifestation would be expressed as PDF. And that is fundamental metadata in an Akuman Tursu document. Right. The other question of Jai is about manual tagging that is involved. And is there any other way to work around that on any, uh, or try and see, minimize manual tagging as much as possible? Yeah. So, so there's there's different approaches to that, you know. So, uh, so you know, one is manual tagging. You know, that's uh, well, you know that's going to work uh, if you. It's going to work from if you start from the current. Let's say you you uh, you know you want to say I have a you know all the laws from now they're going to be uh, you know they're going to be drafted in the system and all the laws from now will be drafted. So even when these projects are done, typically. The now is one project of how you're going to handle the how you're going to handle the current problem. You know how are the laws going to be tagged from now, and the past is handled as a different project because typically you have an older canon of legislation which needs to be tagged, and that requires different technology and a different set of skills. So the output format is the same, Akomantoso. But the technology that you apply is different. So in the first case, you, you know, you will have a legal drafting editor which supports Akumantoso and you would start tagging, uh, you know, acts which are being passed now and bills that are being drafted now, you know, you would tag them. For the past, uh, I've done a project, as I mentioned, you know, which took like 30 years of documents and converted that. Uh, I, I, so there's no one size fits all, you know, it depends. On the context and the structure and uh, what what probably works for you. So what I ended up doing, I looked at different technologies when I did the project. I looked at natural language processing and you know different things. Uh, but in the end, what really worked was uh, uh, just writing a DSL. At least in my case, you know, writing a domain-specific language parser. Because the thing with laws is, as you mentioned, the laws are code. So you'll find if uh, you, if, uh, you know, if it's there in many countries, they have a style guide as to how laws are drafted. You'll find that the preamble nine times out of 10 will always have the same syntax. Whereas, whereas, whereas it will start with specific phrases, you know, having, uh, it'll, it'll usually be in a particular case, maybe uppercase. And then when the preamble ends, it will have a particular syntax. There could be 10 different syntaxes, but you will always notice that there is a particular syntax. So if you analyze 
if you are able to analyze the body of documents, you can possibly cover 90% or 95% of it using automated conversion. You know, by by writing custom DSLs uh, and natural language processing, you know, or integration of the two, you can do automated conversion of a lot of the past. You know, and then the remaining 5% is what you handle uh, in the regular way. You either uh, tag it manually or you partially tag it manually or you write custom scripts and so on. So there's no one size fits all uh, recipe for this because uh, it really depends on the nature of the laws and what format they are in. So if you look at uh, government notifications, for example, if you look at tax notification, uh, you know, like if you go to the uh, customs notifications uh, in the Indian tax portal, you'll find that they come in very weird shapes and forms. They don't have a standard form because they are typed by some clerk sitting in an office, but they are law, you know, because they refer to customs regulations and they get amended and they have weird things like tables, tables with call spans and, uh, you know, those kind of things. So those 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 things are the real technical challenges. How do you how do you convert those? So what I see uh, people do in many countries is not uh, they decide not to convert things like those very complex tables because in some cases those tables were not even done on something like Word. They were done on a typeset machine. You know they were done in an old typeset machine with cyclo styling or whatever. And uh, they are almost impossible. I mean, it's a cost benefit analysis. If your project has enough budget, then you convert those parts of the document into, you know, uh, into an electronic form or you retain it as a scanned image, you know. So, like, Aquamant also allows you to do that. You can have uh, a whole part of the document as uh, XML, uh, you know, in the, in the native form, and then you can have. Uh, Parts yeah. which are just tagged images. Yeah, while you were at that, I have a quick follow up, Ashok. So, I'm, uh, so Delhi High Court has been, in fact, for the last about two, three years, has been discussing allowing judgments to have multimedia content in them. Because for several of these copyright judgments, design judgments, patent judgments that they give out, it is much better, for instance, if there is a super, super cassettes that has sued a copyright infringer, it's better to actually have the multimedia uh, uh, clip in the judgment. So in fact, it has been exploring, in fact, it, it very likely in two or three years, we may have judgments that may have these binary law, uh, these blobs in them. So whether uh, AKN actually emphasizes that, whether it supports it, whether it... Yes, yes, it supports that. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it allows you to embed any kind of media content in there. There's no, there's, there's no limitations. And, you know, okay, you know, the standard has a set of tags, you know, the standard has about 200 plus tags to support different legal contexts and things. But there's always exceptions, you know, so because the law is always about exceptions, there's always a surprise there. So what it allows you to do is also use your own custom namespaces, you know, so uh, typically that's a presentation thing, you know, so you have some kind of weird logo or you have mathematical formulas, for example. Uh, there are laws which have mathematical formulas and equations and stuff like that. So it allows you to use any other standard if you want. So you can use MathML and embed mathematical formulas in there. Uh, there's no restrictions on that. Uh, or you can define your own tags and do that. You know, you can define your own proprietary tags and support that. Uh, things like that. So, right. well, thanks. We have two more questions. I think uh, I don't think we have any more. Um, so one is by Lawrence D. Uh, he asks, I'm just quoting his question as is: Do you see any connection between this kind of formalization and the increasing use of machine learning in legal prediction? Is this a helpful connection that was foreseen by the development of AKN, or do you think the ends intended by OSS? are being co-opted by commercial legal prediction firms. Uh. Now, uh, you know, that's a pretty loaded question. It depends on, uh, so you, you can implement machine learning systems with Akumantoso. I mean, it, uh, you know, it, it, 
it depends on how you are tagging it. Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, legal prediction, I, I know there are ethical concerns. And uh, I mean, there was a, you know, I, I've seen a case where there was one particular court, uh, you, know, one, you know, one particular country's court who were embarking on uh, an Akoman Thurso conversion project. And one concern they had was that people would be able to, you know, that people would be able to take the judgment open data and be able to query the performance of judges, to be able to query and, uh, you know, come up with stats on performance of the judges. And then subsequently the judges would be, could be influenced by that statistical comparison, you know. So, you know, let's say, uh, you know, you want to monitor the quality of judgments in a country. You could have an external uh, monitoring organization take this whole body of uh, judgments in Akoman Toso and, you know, do machine learning on it and, you know, extract meaningful in, uh, information. Like this uh, particular judge consistently takes two months more than other judges or this particular judge uh, issues stricter judgments for the same, you know, for the same kind of case. You know, somebody uh, stole $10,000 this judge sentenced the person for 10 years, and uh, he always seems to do that, while another uh, judge is far more lenient. Or, you know, you could do some kind of analysis just based on the, uh, you know, just based on the appellants and respondents and say, you know, uh, extract other kind of uh, statistical information, like, you know, many of the appellants were, uh, you know, were of a particular race or a particular religion, and their case failed. I mean, I'm just, this is a hypothetical, uh, you know, scenario. But these are real questions, you know, these are uh, real ethical concerns that uh, I've heard, you know, over the years. And unfortunately, uh, the, you know, the standard cannot address that. The standard is about representing information semantically. And what people want to do with it is really not uh, you know, under what the standard is about. It, because the judgment is public information. So it's up to the publisher. Do they want to publish? Do they want to strip out some data and then publish it? Those are, uh, you know, uh, it allows you to do that. Uh, for example, uh, you know, there are specific tags available in Akomanto, so where you want to omit names of appellants or, uh, you know, in, in the case of cases involving minors, or whistleblowers, you can have specific tags where you want to strip names out. Uh, you know, where when the law gets published, uh, there's an indication to the software that is publishing it that these names need to be omitted. You know, so you can do things like that, and you can have your you can decide not to publish uh, information which allows uh, you know things, you know, the cases where judges can be compared, you know, I, I think that's an implementation specific detail, uh, which the standard really cannot address. See, it's, it's a bit like trying to blame HTTP for, for fake news. Uh, yeah, I, I would say it is that. It's really up to the implementer and the service that is uh, providing a command to so or using a command to so. It's an ethical responsibility at that end. But, but, but generally, these is ethical concerns around judges being uh, sort of under the standard. I think we had in law we had answers for it. For instance, there the Supreme Court had resisted sort of live streaming cases for for some time now. But that I mean, those things have been cleared by a judgment last year, perhaps the year before last. Although we we've not had uh, anything. Uh, I mean, live streams comments yet, but I think we will see that soon. Um, yeah, well, that's that's a digression. There's one last question, Ashok, of uh, Dviji Guru. Um, so that is, what would a non-machine dependent form of AKM be? Essentially, the compilation of the history of each act as recorded, archived today in print, or is it something else? Um, I I do I I don't get this. Question fully, Dwiji, if you're still there, can you, if you want to uh, uh, ask this or clarify this question a bit more? 
I think uh, I kind of got the gist of what he's saying. So, uh, right. you know, if, 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 you, if you look at laws historically, so, you know, the law is always printed on, you know, like, for example, uh, you know, I gave the case of the Nalanda or, uh, you know, the other case uh, of the Statute of Marlboro. So in the olden days, laws were written on parchment uh, or on copper plates, you know, things which could last time. So I, I think the question is, uh, in the case of Apoman Thuso, it's all digital. You know, it's tags, XML tags in a digital document. What is the long-term form of that? So the long-term form of that is digital probably. So that is the idea. And uh, you and the really long term form would be print, you know, would be putting the XML on parchment, maybe, you know, <laughs> I think that is, you know, that is one way if you want to do it semantically properly, you would uh, etch that on parchment, uh, long term archival paper, something like that, you would put the XML on there so that you would be able to extract it. Uh, you know, in the absence of any digital there, you know, to be able to get the same semantic information out. I, I think that that is the only way to do it. Okay, thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. I'm sure we, this is not something we've heard the uh, last of. I thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, everybody else, uh, for tuning in. Um, Srinivas, the last word for you. I have one question, I guess. Uh, so in terms of uh, this whole process of standardization and in terms of uh, converting laws, whether it's from the parliament or even the judicial orders, uh, what's missing, I guess, in India is that whole process of uh, a standards body for digital, right? Uh, uh, like we don't know, for example, the standard is being ratified at OSS. In India, you have Bureau of Indian Standards for all forms of standards. Uh, but somehow uh, these standard bodies are like, like MITE itself has one more, uh, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has one more project called the National E-Standardization Project under which is what we got a lot of e-governance, standardization, some of it, I, I won't say it applies to every sector. Uh, but the question I have essentially for you is, uh, sure there are standards, international standards, some of which are being adopted by the Bureau of Indian Standards directly in case of ISO standards. Uh, how would one, how should one go about like getting say something like a Komonotso or or even a modified version of it for Indian uh, courts to be, uh, say, pushed through a standards body. Now, you know, I, you know so I have, you know, I have a, uh, you know, very commercial view of this. So, you know, Akoman Thurso was made to, uh, you know, to provide legislation and uh, judgments uh, you know, in terms of open data and access. But behind all that, there is also a cost motivation. So fundamentally, uh, it's about reducing costs and being able to deliver more at a lower cost. So, uh, you know, I, the way I look at it is not even from approaching a standards body, but this is this should be more CTO driven, you know, uh, like uh, chief technology officer driven, uh, unfortunately, bodies like uh, the courts in India or even the parliaments and even the national archives and people like that, you know, who are the custodians of these laws, they don't have that figure, I believe. I don't think they have a role uh, called a CTO or somebody who has a vision about the data and how it's going to reduce costs and how it's going to make publication cheaper and how it's going to make access to data cheaper. So and from what I've seen in other countries, it's always cost and function driven. It's never, it's rarely standards driven. That's a requirement by law in some places, but the ultimate driver is always, what can I deliver more at lower cost? You know, that, that, that is the, 
that is the fundamental driver. So in the case of the courts, uh, if you see the, you know, the, uh, you know, what is the site where you can access judgment? It's uh, probably Indian Kanun, and that is done by one person doing a project. Uh, you know, if you think of it, a whole country like that, all the courts, they have not done anything. You know, they uh, they could have even made money. You know, to literally put it like that, they could have had. You know, they have the data. They could have, uh, you know, uh, taken the data, published it for the public free of charge, and also sold it to vendors who can do other things with it, like pay, sir. Yeah, you know, something like that. You know, some kind of model like that. So, but. I, unfortunately, I don't know that vision is not there. You know I, that uh, you know uh, that data is essential for a country like ours to grow. You know that legal data, if it's available to everybody, it's available to more people. You don't need so many lawyers. You don't need to spend a couple of thousand dollars just to fight your little case because the law is accessible. It's online, and you can get it. And uh, more lawyers can get access to it, so the prices come down. So, I mean, I've been involved in litigation myself, and it cost me more to do litigation in India than in, uh, than say, in Europe, you know. So, uh, it's, uh, it's crazy, you know, just because you are at the mercy of the law, and the law is known only to a few, because the access to the law is available only to a few. And uh, what is the background of the law, what is the history of the law is not available. Nobody knows. So... That is the tragedy of it, you know. So I think it has to be function and purpose driven rather than a standard, because uh, at least that is my belief, you know. So okay, uh, the economics of it needs to be looked into, yeah. and also the interest which could be by the courts or the judiciary itself. Exactly. Uh, yes, okay. As a follow up, I, follow up Shilvas, I just promised him that he can ask his question. Sanna, you want to ask that follow-up? Uh, I, I just asked, asked him to uh, do an oral follow-up. Vijay, are you, uh, are you able to hear us? He can unmute himself and talk. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Dviji here. Hi, hi. Yeah, um, I actually did type it out. Um, so I actually I have to read the, what I typed out. Yeah, so uh, the explanation to my question was that uh, I was thinking beyond machines. Now, I can understand uh, AKN makes a lot of sense when it comes to machines. But if you think beyond machines uh, and are trying to see if the, it's, it's, it's basically an extrapolation, which is essentially about archiving. Uh, am I right in understanding like that? And uh, the second part to that as an explanatory note is that I'm trying to see if it is more about managing the you know the various things that are possible in the digital space which would not be possible in the print space or in the you know the traditional space so um, it, this is more to understand the standard and uh, some sense map out the possibilities rather than uh, you know uh, uh, like i'm trying to understand what akn is so uh, in to, you know to put it simply akn is a format to represent your law. So, so far you've been typing laws out in Word and PDF document. Uh, and while the laws are not words on paper, the laws mean something. They have a particular structure. They have a preface, they have a preamble, they have sections which have numbers, and they have, and the sections possibly have articles within them which have numbers, and the articles have paragraphs within them which are also numbered, and uh, they, they refer to other legislation. So, uh, and they refer to specific versions of other legislation. So, what Akumantoso aims to do is to capture that, to capture the essence of that, the essence and the meaning of that, this structure and uh, what these references are to other legislation in terms of citations, what the numbers are, what do these numbers mean. So, when you reference a uh, legislation, it's possible to reference, you know, when you write out, Article 3, Section 1, Paragraph 2, you should be able to resolve that to the exact point in the document. You should be able to have a computer, uh, you should be able to write a program that can resolve that 
uh, if you are provided an Opomantoso document by using very simple logic. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does, that does. And in some sense, by practice, I think you just answered that it's primarily about the digital uh, space. And I, that's fine. I, I think I'll read up more and then it will be a little more clear to me. Thank you. Okay, I think we are at the end of the talk. It's almost 8.20. Uh, and I hope we had lots of questions. And I think uh, Shashant Sinha, uh, who runs India Can Indian Kanon, is, was in the audience. And he shared a link of his project. I posted it in the chat, uh, which was on w what he has built on tracking loss in India. Uh, it's in the chat for anybody who wants to access. But we'll try to get him for the next talk as well. Again, thanks, Ashok, uh, for okay. explaining us with the whole uh, common notes standard. And if there is anyone else who want to reach out to your post talk, we'll get you connected to them. And I guess we'll end this talk here.